Chapter Four, Part One, of Famous American Statesmen, by Sarah Knowles Bolton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Alexander Hamilton, Part One. To the quiet and picturesque island of Nevis, one of the West Indies, many years ago, a Scotch merchant came to build for himself a home. He was of a proud and wealthy family, allied centuries before to William the Conqueror. On this island lived also a Yogonot family, who had settled there after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, which drove so many Protestants out of the country. In this family was a beautiful and very intellectual girl, with refined tastes and gentle, cultured manners. Through the ambition of her mother, she had contracted a marriage with a Dane of large wealth, followed by the usual unhappiness of marrying simply for money. A divorce resulted, and the attractive young woman married the Scotch merchant, James Hamilton. A son, Alexander, was born to them January 11, 1757 but he was born into privation rather than joy and plenty. The generous and kindly father failed in business. The beautiful mother died in his childhood, and he was thrown upon the bounty of her relations. The opportunities for education on the island were limited. The child read all the books he could lay his hands upon, becoming especially fond of Plutarch's lives and Pope's works. He was fortunate also in having the friendship of a superior man, Dr. Knox, a Presbyterian clergyman, who delighted in the boy's quick and comprehensive mind. At twelve years of age, he was obliged to earn money, and was placed in the counting house of Nicholas Kruger. Probably, like other boys, he wished he were rich, but found later in life that success is usually born of effort and economy. He early chose Perseverando for his motto, and it helped to carry him to the summit of power. That the counting house was not congenial to him, a letter to a schoolfellow in New York plainly shows. To confess my weakness, Ned, my ambition is prevalent, so that I condemn the groveling condition of a clerk, or the like, to which my fortune condemns me, and would willingly risk my life, though not my character, to exalt my station. I am confident, Ned, that my youth excludes me from any hopes of immediate preferment, nor do I desire it but I mean to prepare the way for futurity. I'm no philosopher, you see, and may be justly said to build castles in the air. My follies make me ashamed, and beg you'll conceal it. Yet, Nettie, we have seen such schemes successful when the projector is constant. I shall conclude by saying, I wish there was a war. The projector was constant, and the schemes became successful. He was indeed preparing the way for futurity, this lad not yet fourteen. At this time, Mr. Kruger made a visit to New York and left the precocious boy in charge of his business. Such reliance upon him increased his self-reliance and helped to fit him to advise and uphold a nation in later years. In these early days, he began to write both prose and poetry. When he was fifteen, the Leeward Islands were visited by a terrific hurricane, in one town five hundred houses were blown down. So interested was Alexander in this novel occurrence that he wrote a description of it for a newspaper. When the authorship was discovered, it was decided by the relatives that such a boy ought to be educated. The money was raised for this purpose, and he sailed for New York, taking with him some valuable letters of introduction from Dr. Knox. He was soon attending a grammar school at Elizabeth, New Jersey. The principal, Francis Barber, was a fine classical scholar, patriotic, entering the Revolutionary War later. The right man to impress his pupils for good. Alexander, with his accustomed energy and ambition, set himself to work. In winter, wrapped in a blanket, he studied till midnight, and in summer, at dawn, resorted to a cemetery nearby, where he found the quiet he desired. In a year, he was ready to enter college. Attracted to Princeton, he asked Dr. Witherspoon, the president of the college, the privilege of taking the course in about half the usual time. The good days of election in study had not yet dawned. The dull and the bright must have the same routine, the one urged to his duties, the other tired by the delay. The doctor could not establish so peculiar a precedent, and Princeton missed the honor of educating the great statesman. 
He entered Columbia College and made an excellent record for himself. In the debating club, say his classmates, he gave extraordinary displays of richness of genius and energy of mind. He won strong friendships to himself by his generous and unselfish nature and his ardent love for others. It is only another proof of the old rule that like begets like. Those who give love in this world usually receive it. Selfishness wins nothing. Self-sacrifice all things. The college boy was often seen walking under the large trees on what is now Day Street, New York, talking to himself in an undertone and apparently in deep thought. The neighbors knew the slight, dark-eyed lad as the young West Indian, and wondered concerning his future. When he was seventeen, a great meeting in the fields was held in New York, July 6, 1774. While Hamilton was studying, the colonies of America had been looking over into the promised land of freedom, driven thither by some unwise taskmasters. Boston had seasoned the waters of the Atlantic with British tea. New York, well filled with Tories, yet had some patriots who felt that the hour was approaching when all must stand together in the demand for liberty. Accordingly, the great meeting was called, to teach the people the lessons of the past and the duties of the future. Hamilton had recently returned from a visit to Boston, and was urged to be present and speak at the meeting. He at first refused, being a stranger in the country and unknown. He attended, however, and when several speakers had addressed the eager crowds, thoughts flowed into the youth's mind and pleaded for utterance. He mounted the platform. The audience stared at the stripling. Then, as he depicted the long-endured oppression from England, urged the wisdom of resistance, and planted in glowing colors the sure success of the colonies, the hearts of the multitude took fire with courage and hope. When he closed, they shouted, It is a collegian! It is a collegian! Hamilton was no longer a West Indian. He was, heart and soul, an American. Liberty now grew more exciting than college books. Dr. Seabury, afterwards Bishop of Connecticut, wrote two tracts entitled Free Thoughts on the Proceedings of the Continental Congress and Congress Canvassed by a Westchester Farmer. These pamphlets attempted to show the foolishness of opposing a monarchy like England. They were scattered broadcast. Then tracts appeared in answer, clear, terse, sound, and able. These said, no reason can be assigned why one man should exercise any power or preeminence over his fellow creatures more than another, unless they have voluntarily vested him with it. Since then, Americans have not, by any act of theirs, empowered the British Parliament to make laws for them. It follows they can have no just authority to do it. If, by the necessity of the thing, manufactures should once be established and take root among us, they will pave the way still more to the future grandeur and glory of America, and by lessening its need of external commerce, will render it still securer against the encroachments of tyranny. This was rank heterodoxy toward a power which had crippled the manufactures of America in all possible ways, and wished to keep her a great agricultural country. The sacred rights of mankind, said the writer, are not to be rummaged for among old parchments or musty records. They are written, as with a sunbeam, in the whole volume of human nature, by the hand of the divinity itself, and can never be erased or obscured by mortal power. The wonder grew as to the authorship of these pamphlets. Some said John Jay wrote them, some said Governor Livingstone. When it was learned that Hamilton, only eighteen, had composed them, the Tories stood aghast, and the Patriots saw that a new star had risen in the heavens. Hamilton knew that the war was inevitable, that the time must soon come for which he longed when he wrote to his friend Ned, I wish there was a war. He immediately began to study military affairs. There are always places to be filled by those who make themselves ready. He was learning none too early. His corps, called the Hearts of Oak, in green uniforms and leathern caps, drilled each morning. While engaged in removing cannon from the battery, a boat from the Asia, a British ship of war, fired into the men, killing the person who stood next to Hamilton. At once the drums were beaten, and the people rushed to arms. The king's storehouses were pillaged, and the Liberty Boys marched through the streets, threatening revenge on every Tory. 
young hamilton fearless before the asia could also be fearless in defense of his friends dr cooper the president of columbia college was a pronounced tory when the mob approached the steps of the institution hamilton nothing daunted appeared before them and urged coolness lest they bring disgrace on the cause of liberty dr cooper imagined that his liberal pupil was assisting the mob and cried out from an upper window don't listen to him gentlemen he is crazy he is crazy but the mob did listen and the president was saved from harm the revolutionary war had begun lexington and bunker hill were as beacon fires to the new nation in 1776 the new york convention ordered a company of artillery to be raised and hamilton applied for the command of it only nineteen and very boyish in looks his fitness for the position was doubted till his excellent examination proved his knowledge and he was appointed captain he used the last money sent him by his relatives in the west indies to equip his company college days were now over and the busy life of the soldier had commenced for most young men the stirring events of the times would have filled every moment and every thought not so the man born to have a controlling and permanent influence in the republic he found time to study about money circulation rates of exchange commerce taxes increase of population and the like because he knew that a great work must be done by somebody after the war how true it is that if we fit ourselves for a great work the work will find us meantime captain hamilton drilled his troops so well that general green observed it made the acquaintance of the captain invited him to his headquarters and spoke of him to washington had not the work been well done it would not have commanded attention but this attention was an important stepping stone to fame and honor hamilton was ever after a most loyal friend to general green the company was soon called into active service at the disastrous battle of long island hamilton was in the thickest of the fight and brought up the rear losing his baggage and a field piece after the retreat up the hudson at harlem heights washington observed the skill used in the construction of some earthworks and finding that the engineer was a young man introduced to him by general green invited him to his tent this was the beginning of a lifelong and most devoted friendship between the great commander and the boyish captain later at the battles of trenton and princeton hamilton was fearless and heroic well do i recollect the day said a friend when hamilton's company marched into princeton it was a model of discipline at their head was a boy and i wondered at his youth but what was my surprise when struck with his slight figure he was pointed out to me as that hamilton of whom we had already heard so much a mere stripling small slender almost delicate in frame marching beside a piece of artillery with a cocked hat pulled down over his eyes apparently lost in thought with his hand resting on a cannon and every now and then patting it as if it were a favorite horse or a pet plaything he had so won the esteem and approbation of washington that he was offered a position upon his staff which he accepted march first seventeen seventy seven with the rank of lieutenant colonel his work now was constant and absorbing the correspondence was immense but all was done with that clearness and elegance of diction which had marked the young collegian he was popular with old and young being called the little lion as a term of endearment in appreciation of bravery and nobility of character when the skies looked darkest as at valley forge hamilton was habitually cheerful seeing always a rainbow among the clouds his enthusiasm was contagious he carried men with him by a belief in his own powers and by deep sympathy with others lafayette loved him as a brother he wrote hamilton before this campaign i was your friend and very intimate friend agreeably to the ideas of the world since my second voyage my sentiment has increased to such a point the world knows nothing about to show both from want and from scorn of expression i shall only tell you adieu baron steuben used to say in later days the secretary of the treasury is my banker my hamilton takes care of me when he cannot take care of himself hamilton wrote to his dear friend lawrence cold in my professions warm in my friendships i wish it were in my power by actions rather than words to convince you that i love you you know the opinion i entertain of mankind 
and how much it is my desire to preserve myself free from particular attachments, and to keep my happiness independent of the caprices of others. You should not have taken advantage of my sensibility to steal into my affections without my consent. Best of all, Washington confided in him and loved him, and we usually love those in whom we have confided. When he wanted a calcitrant general, like Gates, brought to terms, he sent the tactful, clear-headed Hamilton on the mission. When he wanted decisive action, he sent the same fearless young officer, who knew no such word as failure. Sometimes he broke down physically, but the power of youth triumphed, and he was soon at work again. On his expedition to General Gates, in November 1777, with all his desire to keep himself free from particular attachments, he laid the foundation for the one lasting attachment of his life. At the house of the wealthy and distinguished General Philip Schuler, he met and liked the second daughter, Elizabeth. Three years later, in the spring of 1780, when the officers brought their families to Morristown, the acquaintance ripened into love, and on December 14, 1780, when Hamilton was twenty-three, he was married to Miss Schuler. The father of the young lady was proud and happy in her choice. He wrote Hamilton, You cannot, my dear sir, be more happy at the connection you have made with my family than I am. Until the child of a parent has made a judicious choice, his heart is in continual anxiety. But this anxiety was removed the moment I discovered it was you on whom she had placed her affections. In this year, 1780, the country was shocked by the treason of Benedict Arnold. Hamilton was sent in pursuit, only to find that he had escaped to the British. He ministered to the heartbroken wife of Arnold as best he could. He wrote to a friend, her sufferings were so eloquent that I wished myself her brother to have a right to become her defender. For Major Andre, he had the deepest sympathy and admiration of his manly qualities. He wrote to Miss Schuler, afterward his wife, Poor Andre suffers today. Everything that is amiable in virtue, in fortitude, in delicate sentiment and accustomed manners pleads for him. But hard-hearted policy calls for a sacrifice. I urged a compliance with Andre's request to be shot, and I do not think it would have had an ill effect. A month after his marriage, his only difficulty with General Washington occurred. The commander-in-chief had sent for Hamilton to confer with him, who, meeting Lafayette, was stopped by him for a few moments' conversation on business. When he reached Washington, the general said, Colonel Hamilton, you have kept me waiting at the head of the stairs these ten minutes. I must tell you, sir, you treat me with disrespect. The proud young aide answered, I am not conscious of it, sir, but since you have thought it necessary to tell me so, we part. He therefore resigned his position, glad to be free to take a more active part in the war. Washington, with his usual magnanimity, made overtures of reconciliation, and they became ever after trusted co-workers. All these years, Hamilton had shown himself brave and untiring in the interests of his adopted country. At the Battle of Monmouth, his horse was shot from under him. At Yorktown, at his own earnest request, he led the perilous assault upon the enemy's works and carried them. When Hamilton saw that the enemy was driven back, he humanely ordered that not a British soldier should be killed after the attack. He says in his report, Incapable of imitating examples of barbarity and forgetting recent provocations, the soldiers spared every man who ceased to resist. Washington appreciated his heroism and said, Few cases have exhibited greater proof of intrepidity, coolness, and firmness than were shown on this occasion. Letters home to his wife show the warm heart of Hamilton. I am unhappy. I am unhappy beyond expression. I am unhappy because I am to be so remote from you, because I am to hear from you less frequently than I am accustomed to do. I am miserable because I know you will be so. Constantly uppermost in my thoughts and affections, I am happy only when my moments are devoted to some office that respects you. I would give the world to be able to tell you all I feel and all I wish, but consult your own heart and you will know mine. Every day confirms me in the intention of renouncing public life and devoting myself wholly to you. Let others waste their time and their tranquility in a vain pursuit of power and glory. Be it my object to be happy in a quiet retreat with my better angel. 
At the close of the Revolutionary War, he repaired to Albany, spending the winter at the home of General Schuler, his wife's father. He had but little money, and his dues in the service of an impoverished country were unpaid, but he had what was far better, ability. He determined to study law. For four months he bent himself unreservedly to his work, and was admitted to the bar. He steadily refused offers of pecuniary aid from General Schuler, preferring to support his wife and infant son by his own exertions. Such a man, of proud spirit and unwavering purpose, would, of course, succeed. Friends who appreciated the service he had rendered to his country now interceded in his behalf, and he was appointed Continental Receiver of Taxes for New York. To accept a position meant, to him, persistent labor and success in it if possible. He at once repaired to Poughkeepsie, where the legislature was in session, presented his plans of taxation, and prevailed upon that body to pass a resolution asking for a convention of the states that a union might be effected stronger than the existing confederation. The position as receiver of taxes was sometimes a disagreeable one, but it was another round in the latter which carried him to fame. He had increased the number of his acquaintances, his energy and his knowledge to public questions had been revealed to the people, and the result was his election to Congress at the age of twenty-five. Thus rapidly the ambitious, energetic, and intelligent young man had risen in influence. That his voice would be heard in Congress was a foregone conclusion. General Schuler wrote his daughter soon after Congress met, Participate afresh in the satisfaction I experience from the connection you have made with my beloved Hamilton. He affords me happiness too exquisite for expression. I daily experience the pleasure of hearing encomiums on his virtue and abilities, from those who are capable of distinguishing between real and pretended merit. He is considered, as he certainly is, the ornament of his country, and capable of rendering it the most essential services, if his advice and suggestions are attended to. The country was deeply in debt from the Revolutionary War. It had no money with which to pay its soldiers. Its paper currency was nearly worthless. Dissatisfaction was apparent on every hand. There was little unity of interest among the states. Hamilton's plans for raising money, and for a more centralized government, were unheeded, and after a year in Congress, he returned to the practice of law, saying, The more I see, the more I find reason for those who love this country to weep over its blindness. As soon as the war was over, the people began to grow more bitter than ever toward the Tories, or Loyalists. Harsh legislative measures were passed. The Trespass Act declared that any person who had left his abode, in consequence of invasion, could collect damages of those who had occupied the premises during his absence. A widow, reduced to poverty by the war, brought suit against a rich Tory merchant who had lived in her house while the Tories held the city. Hamilton, feeling that a principle of justice was involved, took the part of the merchant, and by a brilliant speech, in which he contended that the fruits of immovables belonged to the captor so long as he remains in actual possession of them, he gained the case. Of course, he brought upon himself much obloquy, was declared to be a Britisher and lover of monarchy, a charge to which he must have grown accustomed in later years. Hamilton's pen was not idle in this controversy. He wrote a pamphlet advocating respect for law and justice, which was called Phocian from its signature. It was read widely, both in England and America. Among the many replies was one signed Mentor, which drew from Hamilton a second letter of Phocian. So inflamed did public opinion become, that in one of the clubs it was decided that one person after another should challenge Hamilton till he should fall in a duel. This came to the knowledge of Mentor, and the abhorrent plan was stopped by his timely interference. There are too few men and women great enough to be tolerant of ideas in opposition to their own, or to persons holding those ideas. Tolerance belongs to great souls only. End of chapter 4, part 1